This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church. At this special time this morning, as 60, about 60 of our members are in New York City this weekend, including three of our ministers and most of our chancel choir. This morning as we worship, we are guided by the texts that our choir will be singing tomorrow night. Texts both from scripture and from the great saints of our faith. We gather for worship each week at Central because we believe that the shared experience of God has the power to transform us. Sometimes like a lightning bolt, but most often transformation happens gradually over time through regular habits and practices like the habit of gathering for worship. So my prayer for you and my prayer for me this morning is as it is every week, that God might use these next few minutes to change our lives. Would you bow with me please in prayer? Heavenly Father, we gather for worship to join with all creation in lifting our voices and our songs of praise to you. It's a privilege to be in your presence and to be together in your sanctuary. May our worship be pleasing to you as we offer our whole selves in Jesus' name. Amen.
please join me in the reading of the litany based on Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Sing praises to the Lord. Shout and sing praises to God. We have witnessed God's mighty acts. We have seen the Lord's greatness. Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. for our children's sermon, please. All right, guys. I've got some pictures to show you this morning, and I would, I'm not even going to ask you if you know who, you, who these people are, because I'm guessing that you don't, but I'm going to introduce them to you, okay? They're, they're all kind of old-timey pictures. This is St. Francis. You see a picture of St. Francis? Uh, he lived about 900, 800 years ago. Uh, St. Francis wrote the words to the hymn we just sang, All Creatures of Our God and King. He was a lover of animals. You see the animals in the picture? You see him? Yeah. You see him, Joey? And so our song is about all creatures of our God and King, Lifting our voices together in praise to God. That's St. Francis. This is a woman named Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard was well known for her spiritual writings, her sermons, and her visions. She was a wonderful Christian mystic. And she was a well-respected female leader in the church when there weren't many of them at all. Hildegard lived in, it was born in 1098, almost a thousand years ago. That's Hildegard. This is St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose was a theologian and bishop in Milan, Italy. He showed great bravery by using his voice to speak out and stand up for the truth of our faith against people who were saying things that might not have been as true about who we are. That's uh, St. Ambrose. Aurelius Clements Prudentius. 348 AD, 1700 years ago, right? He was a Roman Christian poet from Spain. Some of us in this room, maybe at least a couple of us, will recognize one of his poems of a hymn, as a hymn, Of the Father's Love Begotten. And the last one I want you guys to see, this is St. Gregory, 540 to 604. He died in 604, about 1,400 years ago. I'm sorry, Joe, this is St. Gregory, St. Right Gregory. We are connected to all five of the people I've introduced you to through our shared faith and through this church. And each of the five of them, writings from all five of them, are contributing to our worship service this morning. These five people are adding to our worship just like each of you are by your presence. And you can contribute to the story of our faith just like each of them have contributed to the history of our faith and to the story of our faith this morning. Here's what I want you to remember. Not who each of these people are, but that they have used their voice as part of our faith in a way that endures sometimes for more than thousands and thousands of years. So maybe someday, look at me, maybe someday one of you, thousands and thousands of years from now, maybe someday someone will be holding up a picture of you and saying to children thousands of years from now, do you know who this is? Right? <laughs> Let's say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the people across the ages who are contributing to our worship this morning. Remind us that we are connected to great Christians, great saints uh, from centuries ago through our presence here this morning. 
Remind us, too, that we have great things we can offer to our faith as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear these words from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have a number of active duty service members in our congregation. Uh, among them, Lieutenant Commander Joshua Hickman, who led us from this platform in worship just a few weeks ago. Joshua goes to join a NATO command in the United States Navy. Uh, and Marine Lieutenant Davin Williams, whose grandmother, Joy Williams, is in worship with us this morning. Uh, Lieutenant Williams is on a ship right now, headed to the Mediterranean as we worship. The words of this prayer that I'm about to pray this morning come from poet Aurelius Clemens and from St. Gregory, Pope Gregory I, and from Luke chapter 1. They're all taken from Elaine Hagenberg's Illuminare, which our choir will be performing tomorrow night. Heavenly Father, as we worship this morning with wars and rumors of wars spreading across the Middle East and around the globe, as night and darkness and fog, a confused world and turmoil engulf us, as dark gloom tears the earth and beats and stabs the sun, we pray that you would illuminate those in darkness, those living in the shadow of death, and that you would guide our feet into the path of peace. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. View us with compassion. Grant us everlasting goodness. Give us peace. We pray your blessing on all who serve this morning. And we ask that you bless those from among our congregation who have traveled to New York to sing these words we have just prayed and that you might make them true. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name.
Lord God, you've blessed us in so many ways. You've put us in positions of influence and power, and we've been blessed so, so much in terms of our finances. Help us to understand that when you ask of us to give, you're asking us to reach out and touch the lives of those less fortunate than us who have just no chance in life. So help us to be generous, to remember that when you ask, it's to give lovingly and generously. And we ask this in the name of the one who is so generous and loving to us, Jesus Christ. Amen.
of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Where streams of living water flow, my ransom soul he And foolish oft I've strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home. Rejoicing brought me the king of love, my shepherd is my shepherd is the king. So through all the length of days, my goodness failing never, good shepherd, may I sing thy praise. Good shepherd, may I sing thy praise within my house forever. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Lamar. Thank you, Joel, for leading us so well in worship. Tim Urban writes the blog post, Wait But Why? And last week he wrote about last Monday's eclipse. There are about 70 total solar eclipses each century, uh, each resulting in just a thin path of total sun blockage. 
And for most of history, there was no way to know when or where they would happen, but now we can. So last week, Tim Urban ended up traveling to Arkansas to a place in the dead center of the totality path. The sky was perfectly clear. Here's how he describes it. 30 minutes until totality, I looked through my glasses at a crescent sun. It seemed a little dimmer out than usual, but only a little. 20 minutes, thinner crescent, a tad dimmer, maybe slightly cooler than it was before. 10 minutes, a razor thin crescent now, definitely weird lighting. Shadows are very sharp. You can see the shadow of individual hairs on my head. One minute. It's very dim, like early evening, but still feels like daytime generally. Waves of light and dark ripple across the ground like the way light moves at the bottom of a swimming pool. Five seconds. Diamond ring. Just that one last glimpse of sunlight. I take off my glasses and the diamond ring looks strikingly beautiful and strange. Four, three, two, one. The earth's dimmer switch suddenly goes down as dim daylight drops into night totality. It was a totally surreal experience, he writes, something that reminded you you didn't live in a big world, but on the edge of a tiny rock floating through the vastness of outer space. A glimpse of truth about reality. I saw one sphere positioned in front of another sphere with two spheres, Venus and Jupiter, floating nearby. More than ever before, he says, it felt obvious that I was standing on the edge of a fifth sphere. For the first time in my life, he writes, I was looking at the solar system. <laughs> I looked around, it was dark. There was a 360 degree sunset along the entire horizon. By a minute in, there was a chorus of crickets chirping at two in the afternoon. And then the moon moved on, the sun peeked out, and it was over. Hildegard of Bingen was a German Christian mystic who lived about a thousand years ago. Among other things, she has grown famous for her writings and her visions. Uh, she writes, from my early childhood, before my bones, nerves, and veins were fully strengthened, I have always seen this vision in my soul. Even to the present time, when I am now more than 70 years old. In this vision, my soul, as God would have it, rises up high into the vault of heaven and into the changing sky and spreads itself out among the different bodies. And because I see the visions this way in my soul, I observe them in accord with the shifting clouds and other created things. I do not hear them with my outward ears, nor do I perceive them by the thoughts of my own heart or by any combination of my five senses, but in my soul alone, while my outward eyes are open. The light which I see in my visions is not spatial. I can measure neither height nor length nor breadth in it. I call it the reflection of the living light. And as the sun, the moon, and the stars appear in water, so my writings, sermons, and virtues take form for me and gleam. Back in 2017, uh, during the last solar eclipse, the one before this week, I took a group from my previous church, Heritage Fellowship in Canton, Georgia. I took a group of us up to the Rabin Gap, Tallulah Falls area of far northeast Georgia so that we could see that solar eclipse in its totality. Uh, here's what I wrote about that experience as soon as we got home. 
when the moon had almost completely obscured the sun that Monday, maybe by 98% or so, the quality of the light changed. A little softer, maybe? The different hues took on a bit of a pastel quality, perhaps. The colors became a bit more gauzy, like a faded photograph. I can be a little bit of a science nerd. I, I'm fascinated by, by physics and the exploration of the universe. It's amazing to me what scientists have been able to figure out just by charting the courses of the heavenly bodies across the sky. So I was pretty excited to see this eclipse back in 2017. In fact, I was so excited that I worried that I'd built my hopes up too big and that I would end up being disappointed by the experience. I wasn't. <laughs> The setting was perfect. Green fields and rolling hills, mountains in the distance, bright colored umbrellas spread out across an open field shading us from the sun, music and food trucks and frisbees and football across that big open field as we all waited together. Fresh tomato sandwiches were sold around the edges at tables by local vendors. Scientists with telescopes were scattered about, inviting us all to have a look through their eyepieces as the moon began to pass in front of the sun. And then as the decisive moment got closer, we all ran back to our blankets and chairs and the quality of light began to change. I'd read about it from others who had experienced eclipses before, it was one of the things I was most looking forward to experiencing, this change in the light. And it was otherworldly. And then just like the flip of a switch, it happened. What had been gradual before was gradual no more. The sun disappeared completely behind the moon. And for the first time in my life, I was able to look directly at the sun or rather at where the sun should have been, it was gone. In its place was just a black disc hanging up in the darkened sky with a ring of soft white light around it. I had a physical reaction to the event. My heart beat faster. My breathing became shallower. I was immediately aware that what I was experiencing would not last as long as I wanted it to. So I was conscious of trying to take it all in while I could. I paid attention to the temperature. It was cooler, like they said it would be. I paid attention to the sounds. Where I was, it was just serenely quiet. I paid attention to the people around me, all enraptured as I was at what we were experiencing together. The sky around the eclipsed sun was not black like night, but strangely purple. A few stars peeking through. The horizon and the mountains in the distance just barely visible in the darkened sky, visible with an eerie quality that words just won't do justice. But it isn't the darkness you remember. It's the profoundly, strangely new quality of the light, the illumination. Like Peter at the transfiguration, I wanted to say, let's just set up tents and stay right here forever. That's what I saw. What's more difficult is to describe how I felt, somewhat overwhelmed, I guess, even warmed. Inwardly warmed by the shared experience out there in the field, intimately aware of the power and presence of God. Some people in that field shouted with joy. Some people cried. It was a spiritual experience, a mystical experience. <laughs> the experience in its totality, pardon the pun, <laughs> was all that I had hoped it would be and more. 
and it has lingered with me for nearly seven years now. At the conclusion of one of her visions, Hildegard of Bingen wrote, Love abounds in all, from the depths most excellent to beyond the stars. That's how I felt for those four minutes when the moon completely obscured the sun. Love abounds in all, from the depths most excellent to beyond the stars. And that love abounds in all text from Hildegard. It's one of the five texts to Illuminare, the piece that members of our choir will be singing in New York City tomorrow night. The piece is divided into five movements. It's about light and love and darkness and peace and light again. Each of the five sections takes its text from an early Christian father or mother, including the quote from St. Ambrose that appears in your worship guide as our meditation this morning. Splendor of God's glory bring forth light from light. In addition to the church fathers and mothers, Elaine Hagenberg's choral piece uses two pieces of scripture. Joel read the main one for you earlier in worship this morning. It's from the Gospel of Luke, the, the Song of Zechariah. Illuminate those in darkness and guide our feet into the path of peace. The other text comes from John 14. The Illuminare choral piece is just over 20 minutes long. We've been referencing the English translations here from St. Ambrose and from Hildegard and from Luke chapter 1, but the whole thing is sung in Latin. It's not in English at all. All of Illuminare is presented in Latin, all except for one section, which appears about 18 minutes in. Just two sentences of the whole thing are presented in English. As you might imagine, that makes them really stand out. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. In a choral piece about light, the only words in English are about peace. The light of God's presence bringing an otherworldly peace, not as the world gives. And when you listen to the music, as many of you had the chance to do at the Nixon Center a few weeks ago, and as 2,000 people will have a chance to do at Carnegie Hall tomorrow night, as you listen to the music, that's what you feel. The light of God's presence bringing an otherworldly peace. The experience of great music expertly presented is a bit of a mystical experience. When you listen to the music, that's what you feel. The power of God's presence to bring an otherworldly kind of peace. Illuminare moves from light to darkness and back to light again with the experiences of love and peace woven in like a solar eclipse <laughs> and just as powerful. Whether listening to great music expertly presented or standing in an open field as the moon obscures the sun, when you experience the mystical new quality of the light, illuminare. When you feel intimately and exponentially connected to the powerful truth of the presence of God, here's what you also know. Love abounds in all, from the depths most excellent to beyond the stars.
It's all out there waiting for us. <laughs> Scripture says if we ask for it, it will be given. If we seek for it, we will find. If we knock, the door will be opened. Doors of perception and experience and peace and love and truth. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God may be doing in your life or in your heart. I mentioned lots of Sundays that there are as many ways for you to respond right now as there are people in this room. And my invitation this morning is for all of you to open your hearts to be willing to seek right now, just for these next few minutes, right where you are, God's guidance and activity in your life. But if there's a way you would like to respond publicly this morning, either by giving your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the very first time, or by choosing this morning to join Central Baptist Church as an official member to say, Right here is where we want to plant our flag as a family to be part of what God is doing here at Central. I would invite you to make either of those decisions publicly by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we stand and sing together, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. The words are printed in your worship guide. this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives both of our church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Would you bow with me please now for our benediction. Depart now in peace and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole. Put you together spirit, soul, and body and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.